Hello, today is May 25th, 2018. I'm meeting today with Mr. Bill Miller at his home in Greeley, Colorado. My name is Brad Hoops. I'm the interviewer for the Northern Colorado Veterans History Project. Welcome, Bill, and thanks for sitting down today to, to tell your story. Well, thanks for coming over. You bet. Let's start, if we could, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, your date of birth, where you were born, a little bit about your family. Okay, uh, I was born in Wheeling, Wyoming, and uh, my date of birth is January 2nd, 1941, and uh, my dad was a farmer. Okay. And then uh, when I was two years old, we moved down to a farm north of Eaton. I don't know how many years he was there. But that's basically where I grew up. Grew up in Eaton, okay. Right. Any brothers and sisters? Uh, <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> uh, I got I, what, nine brothers and uh, three sisters. Is that right? And where do you fit in that order? Uh, kind of on the top half. I'll be there. But, uh, Right now, it's just me and a uh, brother that lives in Arkansas that's alive now. I'll be darned. Uh, wow. And so then you grew up and went through the school system there in, in Eaton? Right. Okay. And then uh, we, uh, the guy that dad farmed, uh, you know, leased his land from, he went to... Uh, he bought a new farm out by Gill, and we moved out there. And I went to Gill for uh, two or three years. And then from there, Dad went to Wiggins, hmm. and then uh, we found out there. Okay, so, and that's where you, you graduated high school? I graduated school? from Wiggins. Wiggins, okay, all yeah. right. Well then, uh, take your story after high school. Uh, where'd, where'd you go from there then? Uh, the cattle market put dad out of business so I went to uh, road construction then. my first job I was 18 and I was an oiler on a road construction crew and then uh, after a year or so uh, went in as an operator run heavy equipment and then 42 years later I got <laughs> so you, that was your career year? Right. Wow, wow. Yeah, even after I got out of the service, I went, back. went right back, yeah. Well, uh, talk about how you, did you enlist then, or did you, were you drafted, or how'd you get in the service? I had my draft papers, and I didn't want to go camp out in Vietnam, so I enlisted in the Navy, the recruiter took care of my draft papers then. <laughs> So, uh, and then I went to uh, boot camp in San Diego, and my uh, the chief that ran the, the section, he was an old submariner, and he's the one that talked me into going into it. Well, let me back up and ask you real quick. How was that transition going from civilian life into military life for you in boot and camp? Uh, so was that much of a, a transition for you? Or? Uh, it was uh, different, really different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I was the oldest one in the, it was in uh, the barracks there. Everybody else 17, 18 years old, and I'm 21. Yeah, so you were yeah. pop. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> so uh, and then after uh, boot camp, uh, the chief talked me into go, you know, going into the submarine part of it. And what was the uh, enticement to that? I mean, what what was the interest the interest in, in going that route? Uh, I mean, here's a landlocked farm boy from Colorado going under the sea, yeah, <laughs> let alone on the sea. But uh, <coughs> well. He made it sound so interesting. So uh, I just kind of wanted to see what was going on. I'll be damned. And then uh, went to uh, sub school. Which I understand is a pretty rigorous uh, program to get through. Uh, oh, yeah. 
Yeah, you'd better have, have your boots on or get rid of them. But uh, it was in New London, Connecticut. So I went from San Diego to New London. The worst part of that sub school was uh, learning how to <laughs> escape from the submarine. Oh, yeah, through that, that tower, uh, uh, that water tower? They take you down 150 foot, then you inflate your life vest, then you bob to the top, but you gotta blow the air out. You gotta pace yourself so you don't get the bends, right? It's, uh... It ain't so much that, it's uh, blowing the air out so you don't explode your lungs. Oh, jeez. It's uh, the pressure differential in your lungs. And then going up the tower, they, they always had a diver that goes up with you. If you get in trouble, they had to pull you off to the side. So, and that was no problem for you? I mean, that just sounds sounds well, awful, to <laughs> be honest with you. It, it didn't, uh, didn't go too bad. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. And how about the rest of the program? I heard it, it's a vigorous uh, physical and mental uh, program to get through that only a select few get really chosen for. Yeah, they, they kind of select their crew, especially when you get assigned to a boat. Because when you get uh, uh, assigned to a boat, you're non-qualified is what they call it. And then you uh, you got to get a qualification on on the boat plus a qualification on your job that's on there. So you got nine months to get qualified. If you don't, you're out. And that means, from what I understand, not only are you you've got your specialty, but you've got to learn everybody else's right. So that in case something goes down, you can step in. Right. Wow. Jeez. Yeah, uh, when, when you qualify, <coughs> every department got a tester, and then he takes you through the compartment, what's this for, what's this for, and then the walkthrough on the main part of the qualification, there's a officer and an enlisted man. They start walking you through the boat. You know, I say, okay, what's that valve for? What's that do? Oh, gee. Wow. <laughs> so uh, it, it was uh, a little different. Yeah, I'll bet. And what was your what was your specialty on the ship? Uh, I was a torpedo man. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Wow. But uh, we, uh, when you first got aboard the boat, They call it hot bunking. So three people took two bunks. So if you were on duty, the other person took your place. My first rack was on a torpedo. They had a rack that went over the torpedo and that's where you slept. Wow. And your clothes was all underneath you. You didn't have no place to store your clothes or nothing. So. Now we're, uh, uh you on a nuclear ship, or was it still diesel? It, or? No, it was a nuke. It was a fast attack. It was a second fast attack built. Oh. USS Snook was the number. Snook? Yeah. And, uh, I don't know what it is. Huh? Oh. We uh, go out on patrol from San Diego, and then we play this little war game to Hawaii with uh, American ships. And after that, we'd leave Hawaii, go to the uh, Okinawa, get debriefed. From Okinawa, you go on patrol again, and. At that time, it was the Cold War, and we uh, chased quite a few Russian ships around. Oh, wow. And we went into a place called Vladivostok. Uh -huh. We sit on the, uh, in the bottom of the harbor, 
overnight as soon as the sun comes up. We service. We didn't service. We got periscope depth, took pictures, and then got out. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Thank you. Yeah. So you were based out of San Diego. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And how long when you guys would go out on a on a tour would you be gone for? Uh, what was we was gone. The longest I was gone was four and a half months. The longest I ever went without seeing the sun was ninety two days. Ninety two days. <laughs> And, hey, uh, and I definitely want to talk about that, what, what life is like in a submarine. And I mean, I, I, I get claustrophobic just thinking about it, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, talk about what daily life was like in a submarine. Uh, after you got qualified, like I was a torpedo, but very seldom, my, my business was right there in the torpedo room. Mm -hmm. And then walk through the hatch and there was a galley and a coffee pot, so that's all I needed. <laughs> wow. Wow. Oh, uh, parts of the boat was dark 24 hours a day. Other parts were tw a light 24 hours a day. Only time you could tell it was day or night is in the control room where the officer's deck was. At night, the lights would be red. And Real light color during the day. The outside lights. Yeah. Wow. But uh, one job I always thought was really interesting was uh, there by the control where the officer deck, you know, by the periscopes and stuff. There's a panel about the size of this table and probably that tall. You control the whole thing, whole boat from that panel. You could dive it, you could surface it, you know, whatever you wanted to do. And every knob had a different shape to it. And they'd blindfold you, you get qualified on that. They'd blindfold you, and then they'd take you, go out to sea, and they'd have you dive the boat, surface it, and all that kind of stuff. The only thing that really bothered me is seeing the same people day in and day out. Mm. It, it's the only thing. But the, the confinement didn't, I mean, here's a boy that lived out of a, a wide open plains, yeah. and being confined in that sub didn't bother you at all? No, huh? I didn't. Really? Yeah. Huh. Wow. So you talked a little bit about the uh, the sleeping conditions. Uh, food, I, I always heard that Navy or submarine food was the best in the Navy. Oh, is that, is that, oh yeah. You, uh, the cooks would uh, bake like Monday and Wednesdays, fresh bread, homemade cinnamon rolls, all that kind of stuff. They, they fed uh, full meals four times a day, so you didn't have to get up to go eat. You know, when you're up and you're serving, go eat. So, and then if you, Hungry in between time, you, you could go snack anything you wanted. The only problem was is so much of it was dehydrated. Mm. Like uh, the first week you're on a boat, you got fresh fruits and vegetables and that kind of thing. After that, everything was dehydrated or frozen. And then you kind of had to get used to that kind of stuff. Well, what, what would you do with your time when you weren't on duty? What uh, to entertain yourself? Uh, uh, I read a lot of books, and then we had a every night they run a movie, and then uh, played a lot of cards, and then uh, checkers and chess, and that, depending on what all everybody wanted to do. So. Gotcha. And, and being under uh, underneath and, and, and not having the, seeing the cycle of day and night, did that throw off your sleeping at all? I mean, were you... Uh, a little, little bit. Where you, it really bothered you is once you got on shore, and then you, you had to kind of get 
use of things again. Oh, jeez. <laughs> and, and how long would that take you to do? I mean, uh, two or three days. Is that right? The wor worst smell was uh, fresh air when you open it. Really? Yeah. Yep. Wow. So the circulation system that was pretty good as far as, I mean, I can't imagine a, a boatload of men, uh, things could smell all that well, up, well you know, down the road. But, but the guy next to you smelled just as bad as you did. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but they had CO2 scrubbers, and then they bled oxygen in that boat all the time. So, you know, you know they recycled it quite a bit. Wow. And how many time, how many missions did you go out on during your career? Oh, geez. Uh, four. Four? Okay. Wow. I, I was in... Four years, two months, and eleven days. <laughs> <laughs> I extended one time so I could go overseas again, and then they had me uh, give me an early out for Christmas in '67. Was there any thought of making it a career at all? Uh, not really. No. Hindsight, I should have. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it just you know I, I enjoyed it. it yeah. Like. yeah, yeah, That well, you, you talked about being on uh, sitting in the, in the harbor in, in, in that Russian port. Would you, would you have to go total silence then? Uh, right. No, nothing ran. Uh, it was just dead quiet, and then. Uh, Right at daybreak, they kind of ease up and where they wouldn't make no noise. And then we got out. <laughs> wow, jeez. <laughs> that, that, uh, that didn't worry you at all that you were sitting at the bottom of a, uh, a, of a Russian port that uh, you could have been. I guess I didn't really uh, uh, think about it. <laughs> One thing about it, if something happened, you got a lot of company. Yeah, jeez. <laughs> Uh, yeah, see, there was a hundred people on board, ten officers and the rest they enlisted. So. Wow. Yeah. And where did your other other tours take you? The, the I uh, just Westpac is the only place. Oh, you're in the Westpac company. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, we always went to the islands. We I talked about in the Philippines. That's where we had called upkeep, where you repaired the ship. And then we would go to Japan and stop Chinhei, Korea, I think, one stop we made. And, you know, just different ports like that. And those ports, they would allow shore leave? Uh, right. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Wow. yeah, that one place in Japan, in Sasebo, he was uh, <laughs> demonstrating against the boat that we come in on because it was a nuclear. Okay, right, and yeah. That's, they were like 4,000 4, people at the gate there. So we had to get escorted off the base. <laughs> oh, jeez. Wow. Wow. Um, but, uh, yeah, it was interesting. Uh. Were you ever in any situations where you were worried as far as, uh, uh, I don't know, playing cat and mouse with a, with a, with a Russian sub or uh, were you ever in a predicament where, see, I, would, I, I guess I would, I, I keep going back to being hundreds of feet below the surface of the water and something happens, I mean, there, there's just no escape really. Right. Uh, no, I, I guess the thought never crossed my mind. I guess that's probably best not to think yeah. about it. Uh, Everybody knew where we was going because like the navigation charts, they'd have them laying out up on the officer, uh, the duty officer's uh, desk. If you wanted to read it, you'd sit there and read it. <laughs> so, you know, there, there was nothing really secret about it. They're down below, but on top, I'm sure nobody no, no. knew where you were, where right. you guys were. Yeah. 
and you'd always be solo, or would you be working with uh, other ships or other subs, or is it we just were a solo all the time? Oh, no, yeah. man. And how, you know, being isolated like that, I, obviously you're not getting mail, or uh, how, how were you getting, or were you getting information about what was going on in the world? Uh, could you communicate back home, or were you just on total? You didn't have any communication with outside world until you, until you went into a port or service. <laughs> I used to get uh, my mail in a bag. Oh, probably that big, because you know, bigger family that everybody oh, write right, letters. Yeah. And <laughs> oh, it, it was different. Yeah. So, like on that tour when you said you were underwater for ninety days, so for ninety days you had no idea what was going on in the rest of the world. Nope. And, wow. That's no, nice. you didn't. No newscast or nothing. That's, uh, I still can't comprehend it. I really just can't. But, uh, how, what was your favorite port of call? When, when, uh, did you have a favorite one that you... Oh, I, uh, I like Hong Kong. Uh, it was uh, British. Yeah, right. Uh, and that, that was uh, like the Philippines, like going down in old Mexico. Uh, and that kind of stuff. So, mm. and, and during during your time, uh, obviously it was you didn't have to in a time of war. But you, did you ever get a chance to shoot a torpedo? With yep. the, the, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we uh, sank uh, an old uh, destroyer. Oh, really? Off the coast of uh, San Diego, making a fish reef, reef. artificial reef. reef. Right. Oh, wow. For the fish. Uh, we used uh, the so, uh, torpedoes we used, Mark 37s, was electric. You know, you could shoot them out or they'd swim out or whatever. Mark 14s was the old World War II ones. They had eight, 888 pounds of HBX in the warhead on it. So what, what we did was we used the 37s to put the ship dead in the water, then we finished it off with a, wow. with a 14. Wow. So, wow. Yeah. And then uh, we planted mines uh, uh, off the coast of Vietnam. I can't remember the name of the port. They was kind of miniature torpedoes. They was the newer version. You loaded them and shot them, and then they sit on the bottom, and then sound activated them. So, huh? Wow. Wow. So you did a tour off the coast of Vietnam then as well. You? Well, we did two. Two of them. Okay. Uh, our job was to pick up down pilots. Oh really? Yeah. Oh wow. Picked up one. Really? Yeah. All the submarine <laughs> mariners I've interviewed, I, I'm just fascinated by your story. To me, oh, it's yeah, just, yeah, right? it, it's just, uh, it just seems so unnatural to me to be in that environment. Oh, but, oh, but everyone oh, I've talked to always oh, said they loved it. You know that. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you got back. Uh, you, you finished your, your tour and and um, decided uh, you weren't going to make a career. So take your story once you. you okay. What, once I got out. And I worked for a construction company out of Eaton. That's who I went back with. Then I run uh, operated heavy equipment for years. And then once they sold out, I went to a best way pavement here in Greeley and chased all over the country. Actually, what Pueblo? Huh? Pueblo paving? Yeah, feel free to jump in, Ann. Oh, Pueblo paving? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I took two years and went to. Pueblo Paving, the guy I knew wanted me to go down and work for him. Mm 
So how many years all together were you in, in uh, heavy construction? 42 years. Two years. <laughs> if you've driven on a road in Colorado, he probably built it. <laughs> wow. Yeah. But tell the story about uh, meeting Ann and how that all worked out. Uh, it was a blind date. Uh, her friend and my cousin was dating. And we, a place called Post and Bike here in Greeley. <laughs> so, uh, we, uh, the bosses uh, that I work for in Eaton, we were sitting down there one night. She comes wandering up to me and introduced herself. I'm your date for Saturday night. <laughs> and turned around and walked off. <laughs> and my boss looked at me and said, who is that? Not quite that way, but... <laughs> <laughs> he goes, never saw her before in my life. We went to a football game the next day. Right, we went to the Bronco game. Oh, okay. And, uh, that was our day. I'll be darned. So, so he always tells people, I picked him up in a bar, <laughs> yeah, which is nice. <laughs> yeah, right. And how long have you guys been married now? Oh, uh, since 89. 89, okay. So, how many years that is? 20-some, <laughs> 30, about 30. Well, the crew's here. Oh, okay, yeah. so they don't bring the crew out. Second marriage for both of us. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. First one was practice. What's that? First, First one was practice, practice. yeah. <laughs> uh, I got one son. One son, okay. And uh, <clears throat> Anne's got a uh, uh, son and a daughter. Okay. And then uh, my son lives out of Bridgedale on a ranch out there. Okay. And grandchildren? Yes. There's one. <laughs> And then uh, got one boy, the brother, and uh, a girl, uh, uh, my son's uh, daughter. So three, four? Three grandchildren. Three grandchildren. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what they say about grandchildren, don't you? You, know, you tell it better oh. than I do. Grandchildren is a reward for not killing your kids when they're teenagers. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, as we wind down this interview, I know I only got really a, a tip of the iceberg of your story. Is there anything I didn't ask you that you wanted to talk about? Any of the stories that have kind of floated to the top since we've been talking to, sitting here talking, and jump into if there's anything he left out that you'd like him to talk about? Uh, so that ideally we round out your story as, as best as best can, or do you, or do you think primarily we got everything I down that you wanted to talk about? Pretty well, but, I, uh, I think one thing on the submarine that is interesting that he didn't mention is the chief of the boat thought he was too skinny, so he wanted to fatten him up. So he said, every time I come by you, we're going to go, you're going to go eat. So after about a month, he didn't gain any weight, and they had to stop trying because they were running out of food. <laughs> so I think that's kind of a delightful yeah, right. little tidbit right there. Yeah, that's, uh, they thought I was too little, huh. you know, the weight, so at that time I was, I don't know, 120, oh, 25 right pounds. Oh, boy. Well, I would imagine they would want smaller people on the ship. I don't imagine. It, was there was there a weight and height requirement at all? Do you know? At that time, there were. Well, oh, darn. Uh, uh, However, you wouldn't want to get stuck behind a big guy when you're trying to go through the hatch. Right. Somebody that roly poly wouldn't make it through. Yeah. 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 Well, through the years, have you ever kept in touch with any of the guys you served with, or has there been any sort of uh, ship reunions, anything like that? No. no? no. Okay. And that's a shame. Yeah. Really. Yeah. I think they kind of all went their own ways. Yeah, mm. they did. Got, life took over. And they've decommissioned the snook. It's no longer... That's what I was going to ask you. What, whatever came of the, the sub? It, uh, uh, we're driving it around on the road now. <laughs> no, <laughs> it sold for scrap. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah uh, 
they decommissioned it at uh, Bremerton, Washington. That's where they decommissioned it. Oh, so you were part of the team? You were part. You were still on when she decommissioned? Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Have you ever had a chance to um, uh, tour any of the, the newer subs uh, at all? Yes. Well, I don't know how new it was. Uh, we toured a ship in uh, Texas that was in dry dock down there. And also, we were fortunate enough to go over to Hawaii and go out to Pearl Harbor and see the wrecks out or you know, the memorials out there. And he also toured a sub out there. That was an old diesel boat. Yeah, I don't know much about it. I was just curious what you thought about I mean, the old diesel, what you did, and what, what's uh, modern today. If, uh, the, there's no comparison. Yeah. Because uh, the new one we, we toured was a, uh, an FBM fleet ballistic missile one. The center part is where the missiles are. And then when we walk through, you could just walk uh, like a tunnel. That was it. You, you didn't see none of the missiles or nothing. Oh, right. And you guys, you guys didn't carry any missiles? No. Okay. Yeah. No, torpedoes no. all we carry. Okay. Uh, mm. um, you ought to tell him about Jensen out something besides a tornado, a tornado, a torpedo one time. Oh. The chief made you do. Overseas. We, uh, Captain Boat electrified booze at the uh, exchange. Like a quart of, oh, I don't know, Crown Royal cost you a buck. Mm. So they was bringing booze aboard in the box, by, by the box load. Oh, jeez. We stored them in the torpedo tube. Oh. Because that's, he said, that's the only way we're going to do it. Okay. So coming back, uh, who, who's the civilians that come aboard and checks the boat? Uh, I can't remember. Anyway, this crew was going to come in and inspect the boat. No man made a shoot. That torpedo tube loaded with booze out at sea. <laughs> <laughs> you want to get it on the boat? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, you, you get hung. Yeah, right, right. Especially sure. on a Navy ship like that. Um, but took care of that. Uh, <laughs> didn't you say that there, you had somebody playing taps? Playing taps when uh, you were shooting oh, that out? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we used to kid each other yeah. on the boat. And, and how what, how was the, the interaction? Among, I mean, you're, you're you're confined. I mean, if you had fights or something break out, it wasn't like you could go away from it. I mean, every, did everybody get along pretty well with each other, or how? Pretty did... well, because uh, getting qualified, you kind of chose who you served with. Even the officers had to go through enlisted people to get qualified. Really? Wow. Yeah. Huh. So if you had a like a second lieutenant that was uh, the lippy, you'd make sure he wasn't there. <laughs> so it, it worked out good. Okay, me. gotcha, yeah. But we used to pull pranks on everybody. Yeah, yeah. What about the second lieutenant that you guys got off the ship that you wouldn't help qualify? Oh, that, that's what happens, yeah. you know. Nobody liked him, so. Well, that's important. Three, uh, nine months is all yeah. you had to put up with him. Couldn't qualify, so he was gone. Yeah, well, that makes sense. I mean, sure. yeah, you got to run a tight ship, and then, yeah. yeah. And then uh, the new guys coming aboard, we'd uh, send them back to the engine room looking for a relative bearing. Oh, he'd take off to the engine room, we'd call back there, they'd have him all over that place. There's no such thing as relative. <laughs> All that is, where are you? <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, we, we used to pull pranks like that all the time. 
Now, I know on the surface ships they have uh, a number of ceremonies, like the, the shell back and what have you when you cross the, the equator and stuff. Was there any sort of that sort of thing uh, underneath when you guys, I don't know, did you cross the equator at all? Or, or, or the International Dateline? I know there were ceremonies for, for those. I just wonder uh, if they did the we same. We crossed them, but we never had a ceremony. Okay. okay. Everybody knew that we did, because they, over the loudspeakers, they said, we're crossing. Because going west, it was a six day week. Coming back, you'd have an eight day week. <laughs> what about the ceremony you had when you went into San Diego and the aircraft carrier was there with Gary? Oh. This weather. That, that wasn't quite a ceremony. Well, but, I mean, running across your brother. Oh, yeah. My oh, brother, really? My brother was in the Navy, too. Uh -huh. Right there, and uh, they was leaving, and we was coming in, and I was on the deck of the sub getting ready to tie up. Next thing I know, somebody's yelling. I look up, there's my brother. Really? <laughs> yeah. And your parents were there too. Right. The tender, you always pull uh, alongside a, a submarine tender. Looked up and there's mom and dad uh, looking up. They they did not. This is Gary and Jody. And, uh, I'll be darn. Uh, but uh, you ought to have seen my dad. Thank you. Once we secured the sub, the civilians could come down. Oh, dad thought that was great. Oh, I'll bet. Yeah. He got me on that periscope wheeling around. <laughs> uh, uh, I'll be darn. That's the family right yeah. there. Okay. Well, is there anything else that uh, you wanted to talk about that uh, I know there's, like I said, we, there's so, I know I only got really the tip of the iceberg, but uh, uh, anything else that I didn't ask you about that, uh, or do you think uh, you feel good that... Uh, I've had a great life, it seemed like. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh, good. Well, the last question I always like to ask in these interviews, when you look back on those that four years in the service, and, and particularly in the subs, it, when you look back on it, is it something that changed your life, played a role in your life, uh, affected your life at all, or is it simply just a chapter in your life that you went through? How do you think you'd answer that? Uh, I, I don't really know how I want to. I know, I'm glad I did, but uh, it, it, it was a different station in my life that uh, I guess I was ready for it. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Well, Bill, I want to thank you for telling, you you, betcha. telling your story today, but uh, more importantly, I want to thank you for your service to our country. You betcha. A hundred years ago. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thanks.